My task this morning is to talk about worshiping our Creator God and what that means. This may, you know, I'm listening to Jeff last night and, and um, listening to his I-64 woes, and um, he was very passionate about all of that, and, and uh, I don't know if I'll get that deep in the weeds with, with you all in this, because this is, uh, this is serious stuff that I'm going to be talking about today. And, and I'm passionate about the serious stuff that the Bible gives us. Um, so uh, what does that mean, worshiping our Creator God? As a, just before we get into that, I want to talk about what it means, what that word creator, creation, what it, to, to create something, what does that mean? Because certainly in our minds, a creator is simply something that makes, someone that makes something that's new. Um, it, it, we, even us as humans, we create things, right? We, we create, we build houses, we have contractors, and we, we take boards and, and cement and bricks and whatever. We build houses. We created a house. Monday through Friday, I'm a software developer. I'm a database uh, manager, and, and I create things for our client. I'm, I, I, I'm on a government contract, and we create things for the client. So I, cr- I create things with my, not necessarily with my hands, my fingers in my, in my mind, uh, how I've been trained. But we always have, whatever it is that we create, we always have something to work with. We begin with pre-existing matter, and then we work to form it in new ways. Even, even someone who is a potter, they take a lump of clay and water, and, a, and I don't know what you call that wheel that goes around and around, not the little bus that goes around, but, the little, but they, they, they use pre-existing mer, uh, materials. Um, even um, one who writes new music. Um, it's pre-existing material that they're working with. Uh, the, it's intellectual. I call that intellectual creations. It, the, even that has rhythms and rhymes and notes and instruments and artistic mediums that provide structure and offer possibilities for that new song that they write. But those are all with the uh, existing and available tools or the raw materials for the artist. God, on the other hand created no such created with no such raw materials um, so when we he, he is in a category all by himself because he started with what absolutely nothing now you bible trained people you know that the phrase is say it with me ex nihilo out of nothing even we were created out of nothing and so he's in a category all by himself. So when we talk about God as creator, we mean that he is the only true creative one. He makes him unique. Colossians 1.16, Paul writes to the church in Colossae and says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And I think key word in there is all. Now, I have a seminary professor, uh, Fink, who had, a, had a, a particular saying, all means all, and that's all all means. You remember that, Dean? Have you, did you have Professor Fink, Dr. Fink? All means all, and that's all all means. He made even the material with which he worked, he even made that. He started from nothing. And so Paul emphasizes the preeminence of Christ as the creator who sustains all things. He not only creates it, he sustains it, which is a greater emphasis on the importance of worshiping God as our creator. So this concept is also found, it's not just limited to what we see in the New Testament, it's throughout the entire scripture. Um, we see in Isaiah 40, verse 28, Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. So Isaiah highlights the eternal, omnipotent nature of God as the one who created everything. And this underscores the importance and the significance of worshiping Him. And I'm glad I brought my water with me. 
Now, of course, <clears throat> as you may already know, I love the Psalms. And whenever I have an opportunity to preach, I oftentimes uh, gravitate to the Psalms somewhere on that subject. And David has a wonderful song, which is what the Psalms are. They're just a collection of songs. He's got a wonderful song for us to consider on this subject. And that's Psalm 96 that we're going to be looking at. But very briefly, the text in verse 9 uses the phrase, and I'm going to butcher the Hebrew language, Shekal Yehovah Hadra Kodesh Hadra, which translated means worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. He emphasizes how, emphasizes how our reverence and awe of God accompanies the worshiping of our Creator God. So if you'll join me, let's dive into this precious psalm together, Psalm 96. <clears throat> oh, sing to the Lord a new song. There you go, Keith, a new song, right? Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless His name Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of all the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let's say that together. The Lord reigns. Because we were just instructed to say that. The Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the people with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Join me in prayer. Father God, we are here today for a purpose. But we, as, as, we, as we recognize through what Jeff shared with us today, we sometimes have these hearts that are weighted down with, with sin and other things that uh, encumber us to hear the truth of your word, to hear the truth of whatever message you want us to hear. And so we pray, God, as we endeavor to walk through this today, we pray, God, that you would remove all of that from us for a season that we might have clear understanding of what you'd have us today. God, I pray that you would move your servant to the side and you be the teacher and the preacher for us all. May the words that I speak today be your words and not mine. For the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And so in the psalm, I find that there are three causes to define our worship of our Creator God. And the first one is our, His majesty. Let us begin by acknowledging that the, the majesty of our Creator God. In 4 through 6, we're called to ascribe to the Lord, do His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness and tremble before Him all the earth. So God's majesty is manifested through His existence. You know, we should note that if we, if we go from Genesis to maps, if we note that the Bible never attempts to prove, nor does it argue the existence of God. The central affirmation of the Bible is not there is a God. Rather, it is that God has spoken. And if God has spoken, therefore He exists. In Exodus 5, Moses records God's supreme name, the name which God spoke Himself. He told Moses, I am. And God is speaking in a tense that defines Himself as the self-existent one, which is what we were talking about just a few minutes ago, that He needed nothing with which to create. 
There is absolutely, in that He is the self-existent one, there is absolutely no one, there's absolutely nothing that can present a compelling influence on God. His purposes cannot be thwarted, and likewise, the work He performs cannot be undone. And I even have in my notes here as a side note, that we cannot undo God's actions, we cannot override any of His works, and if His work includes the salvation of your soul, dear heart, that cannot be undone. From Genesis to Maps, the Bible operates under the assumption that God exists. So He's manifest, His majesty is manifested just through His mere existence. His majesty is manifested through His nature. What is his nature? First of all, he is infinite. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is the Alpha and the Omega that we read in Revelation. God is spirit. He has no material body. Yes, we read many of the anthropomorphisms. That's a, that's a hundred dollar word that just means that there's scripture that talks about the hands of God, the eyes of God, the heart of God, bodily parts that emphasize how God works, that's what that, said, that anthropomorphism is. And we read of those, but he has no physical body. He is spirit. God is a person, and he manifests all the expressions of personality. He feels, he understands. The verse in Hebrew says that, that he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He understands. Brother and sister, if you are going through something difficult and your heart hurts this morning, you can take it to the bank that God's heart is hurting right there along with you. And God is triune. He is in one essence. He is one in essence, but he is three in person the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I don't need to go through that with all of you. That's like preaching to the choir, right? You, you guys know that. And let me just say that as we walk through this, you may, you may know all of this that, we are, that I'm talking about or that I present to you, but these are just things that are affirming the truth that He is our Creator God and He's emphasizing, and I'm emphasizing the, the, the foundation of who He is as Creator God. So His majesty is manifested through His existence, it's manifested through His nature, and it's manifested through His attributes. And I was, I was hoping that, uh, 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 <laughs> yeah, last night, <laughs> Jeff, Named. I was hoping that he wouldn't just go through the litany of different uh, 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 attributes because I've got some things that I wanted to talk about. And I said, L it would be a little redundant if you went through them all. But yeah, he's, uh, he, he is, uh, his, the, the attributes are his characteristics or the quality, his qualities that describe who he is, his being, his essence, his nature. Omniscient. He is omniscient. There is nothing that he doesn't know absolutely nothing. I remember my early days in the Air Force, I'm working, in the, I'm working at my desk and I'm, and I'm uh, working on something. I'm really getting frustrated because I can't figure this out. And uh, brother come up, the Christian brother come up, he walked by my desk and, we, and, and he saw I was, had this look in my face. <laughs> I wear my emotions on my sleeve, folks. <laughs> if, if I'm upset about something, you're going to know. If I'm, if I'm tr struggling with something, you're going to know. Because I, I, I can't hide that. So he saw that, and he's looking at me, and he, we, we're talking, and, um, and he, he, he told me, you know what, just, Bob, just pray about it, because if you don't know it, God does. Even the silly things like all the workings of the supply logistics system in the United States Air Force, God knows about all that stuff, Neil, right? Whatever it is, he knows there is nothing that God doesn't know. He is omnipresent, and that is the hard thing. He is both imminent and transcendent, and he's not restricted by space or time. I, I, often, I often describe it this way when it comes to time. First of all, foremost, folks, God created time. We didn't do that. God created time, and he's not bound by the restrictions of time. And so I look at it this way, the time is like this box in which we mortals have to live in. We have a beginning and we have an end on this earth, and we live in this box. 
God, however, is outside of that. And he's looking into that box. And he sees that box. He sees all the happenings that are chronologically ordered. He sees it all at one time. Why? Because he's outside of that box. And so he is, when I say he is both transcendent and imminent, he's transcendent because he's outside of that and he's not bound by anything, but dear hearts, he is imminent. He is living within you if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. He is there right next to you when you sin. When you do something you know is not God's will, he's right there next to you. That's the hard part to swallow. Because we forget, God doesn't, we forget that He's right there with us. He is omnipresent. He's omnipotent. His power, His strength knows no bounds or limitations. Job 42, 1 and 2 says, I know that you can do all things that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. We like to quote that often, you know, God's purposes can't be thwarted. We say that real quick, we're paraphrasing what was written in the book of Job. He is eternal. Again, He is neither beginning nor end. If He has no beginning and no end, He never came into being. He is. Which is the derivative of I am. He is. Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And like that, everlasting to everlasting, both of them are, are, are infinitely described. Everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He is transcendent and imminent. Concurrently, He stands outside of time. He is holy, which is very important for us as we consider the Creator God. He is holy. 1 John 1, verse 5, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. And so as you're walking through doing what you're doing, and and, and things may be suspicious, you may have in your mind uh, a a suspicious uh, understanding of what's going on, whether it's right or wrong, probably wrong, because... God, there is no darkness in him at all, whatsoever. There's no gray area with God. It's all light. We need to walk in the light, as John tells us. So his majesty is manifested through his existence, through his nature, through his attributes. His majesty is manifested through his greatness. The entirety of Scripture gives voice to the infinite greatness of God. Psalm 147, verse 5, Great is our Lord and abundant in power. Understanding is beyond measure. We can never, we will never fully understand this side of glory, all there is to know about God. And that's why it's important that we dive in. And as I speak that, (laughs) it's convicting to me because I don't dive in there as much as I ought. We need to get in there and learn about him more. So I'm thankful for this conference where we can do exactly that. That's the purpose of this entire weekend. So dear friends, because he is the one who spoke the world into existence, our God is worthy of all honor and grace. His majesty is cause for our worship, but it doesn't stop there. We're called to declare his glory. That's what the psalmist writes. In verse 3, our text, we're reminded to declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous deeds among all peoples. And so the first thing that we need to unpack here then is what exactly is His glory which we need to declare among the nations. So previously in, 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 in the Psalms, in the Psalter, Psalm 19, 1, David made this statement, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. And so looking at a piece of art or reading any great work, we we catch a glimpse of the artist or the writer. If you have children, you may even be able to guess which child created the drawing, right? If you, if you have more than one child, then they both are, are drawing something. You could probably, without saying who gave them to you, you probably say, oh, you did this one. Because you know your child because it expresses their personality in the art that they were created. 
Because what we create in there in, inherently represents a piece of who we are. And the same can be understood about the natural world in which we live. We catch glimpses of our Creator in what He has created. And since God is the Creator of all things, right? The skies, the seas, all creatures, humans, everything in this world, it's, it's a natural thing that every part of creation reflects and declares the glory of its Creator. And so when we look around us, everything we see is a clear and vivid indication of the Creator. In Romans 1, Paul wrote that God has revealed enough of Himself in nature that nobody has an excuse for rejecting Him or for doing what is wrong, right? Remember that verse, all the people that went through Romans? Let me read it to you. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. We are without excuse. We can't stand before God and say, um, um, well, we'll probably just say, um, um, and, but we got nothing. We got nothing. Is that comparable to, to uh, Jeff's ain't? We got nothing. Okay? But it isn't enough to just sit back and enjoy the splendor of who he is or what he's done. I thought it interesting when I compared the two statements in these two Psalms, 19.1 and 96.3. When the, what the heavens had declared in 19.1, David charges us to declare to the nations both his glory and his deeds. If he starts out with recognizing the glory and the deeds of God, and then he turns around in 96 and tells us we have a charge to go out and declare exactly that. As followers of Christ, we're called to be ambassadors of His love and grace. We're called to share the good news of salvation with all those around us. Worshiping our Creator God is interwoven in our evangelical charge as followers of Christ. We're to praise God among the other people, among all the nations. Our delight in God's glory needs to go global. Why? Because He is a global God. He is Lord over all. He reigns over all. Right now, in this very moment, there is one God who rules the entire universe. From Beijing to Berlin, from Nepal to New York, and Mumbai to Minneapolis, Tokyo to Toronto, our God reigns. One God is worthy of praise, and His name is Jehovah, Yahweh. Even more, David, uh, he's declaring God's glory is not in a contained event. There are no borders to his doxology. And one thing that I learned from Pastor Keith that I so appreciate since he's been here is, is that um, our theology needs to dictate our doxology, not the other way around. Because man, come up, man can come up with songs that can um, preach all different kinds of theologies. So the songs we sing need to be reflective of the truth we find in God's Word. Theology dictates doxology. And I never really, I, I, I may have heard that, but I never really understood it until the times that he and I have had to, to, to talk and share about that. And so I, I, I appreciate that. But with God, there are no borders to his, doc, to his doxology. Let us then not shy away from proclaiming the greatness of our Creator God. Neither let us be remiss in declaring his redemptive work in our lives. So dear hearts, I say again, we are, de we are called to declare his glory. And finally... In this psalm, we, we, we find this um, calling or that, that, about the joy of worshiping our Creator God. Last, David exhorts us to embrace the joy that comes from worshiping our Creator God. In Psalm 96, 9, we're encouraged to worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness, tremble before Him all the earth. And so true worship is not just an outward expression. It's not just what we, what we do physically while others are around, 
but it's a heartfelt response to the goodness and the faithfulness of God in our lives. Oh, that our worship would be filled with joy and gratitude as we lift our voices in praise. J. Campbell White, who was the first secretary of the Lamest Missionary Movement in the early 1900s, that was a movement born among businessmen who were captured by a holy ambition to get behind what God was doing in the massive student volunteer movement. Here's what this particular leader among the laymen said. Most men are not satisfied with the permanent output of their lives. Nothing can wholly satisfy the life of Christ within his followers except the adoption of Christ's purpose toward the world he came to redeem. Fame, pleasure, and riches are but husks and ashes in contrast with the boundless and abiding joy of working with God for the fulfillment of his eternal plans. The men who are putting everything into Christ's undertaking are getting out of life its sweetest and most priceless rewards. I love, I love that description because we will never be fully satisfied within ourselves unless we are seeking and praising and declaring who he is to the nations. John Piper, um, in his sermon, I was looking at the sermon text that they had online, in his sermon, Declare His Glory Among the Nations, said the following. Now, this is a little bit lengthy, but follow with me. I think it's up there, right? John Piper, flying like a banner over all the emphasis on the nations in this psalm are verses 1 and 2. And they are all about singing. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name and tell of his salvation from day to day. Why would you begin a psalm about the global reach of God's kingdom and the duty to tell of his salvation from day to day and to declare his glory among the nations, why would you begin such a psalm and the command to sing to the Lord in a new song? The answer is simple. You can't summon the nations to sing if you are not singing. And we are summoning the nations to sing. Verse 1, sing to the Lord all the earth. Verse 11 says, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Even nature is being summoned to be glad. And singing is the consummation of that gladness and that rejoicing. This psalm is calling us to spread a passion for the glory of God and all things for the joy joy of all peoples. And then to summon them to ascribe the glory, this glory to God in songs. This is the hardest and happiest business in the world. Singing to the Lord, the phrase that he had in there, how can we sing, how can we expect or call others to sing and be happy, to be joyful in the Lord if we are not? We have to have that joy in our hearts before we can expect anyone else to be infected by the joy that we spread to others. Dear hearts, Every follower of the Lord of Lords and King of Kings needs to embrace this purpose. Every follower of Christ needs to find the consummation of his reason for living and being part of this great purpose of God to be glorified among the nations. Dear hearts, don't miss what God is doing in and through your lives or around you. Be a part of it. Henry Blackaby, experiencing God, tells us, or he taught us, watch to see where God is working and join in. You don't necessarily have to be something that's pioneering. Just be part of the work. Some people shy away from church planting. It's hard. There's probably some church plant so folks that have been involved in church planting. That's the pioneering effort for God. But you don't have to be that. Just join wherever God is working. And he calls you to jump in there and join in. That's what, that's what our call is. Get the nations on your heart and think rightly about God's global purposes. Feel deeply about his marvelous works and sing with all your heart to the Lord and be a part of the summoning the nations to join you. So then my, my conclusion here, my wrapping this up is kind of short. 
But as we conclude our time together, let us, dear hearts, reflect on the profound privilege we have in worshiping our Creator God. Let us carry the message of Psalm 96 in our hearts, declaring His glory and majesty to those whom we encounter. May our lives be a living testimony to the power and love of our Creator God.